Chapter One of Edison's Conquest of Mars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Edison's Conquest of Mars by Garrett P. Service. Chapter One. It is impossible that the stupendous events which followed the disastrous invasion of the earth by the Martians should go without record, and circumstances having placed the facts at my disposal, I deem it a duty, both to posterity and to those who were witnesses of and participants in the avenging counterstroke that the earth dealt back at its ruthless enemy in the heavens, to write down the story in a connected form. The Martians had nearly all perished not through our puny efforts, but in consequence of disease, and the few survivors fled in one of their projectile cars, inflicting their cruelest blow in the act of departure. Their Mysterious Explosive They possessed a mysterious explosive of unimaginable puissance, with whose aid they set their car in motion for Mars from a point in Bergen County, New Jersey, just back of the Palisades. The force of the explosion may be imagined when it is recollected that they had to give the car a velocity of more than seven miles per second in order to overcome the attraction of the earth and the resistance of the atmosphere. The shock destroyed all of New York that had not already fallen a prey, and all the buildings yet standing in the surrounding towns and cities fell in one far-circling ruin. The Palisades tumbled in vast sheets starting a tidal wave in the Hudson that drowned the opposite shore. Thousands of Victims The victims of this ferocious explosion were numbered by tens of thousands, and the shock, transmitted through the rocky frame of the globe, was recorded by seismographic pendulums in England and on the continent of Europe. The terrible results achieved by the invaders had produced everywhere a mingled feeling of consternation and hopelessness. The devastation was widespread. The death-dealing engines which the Martians had brought with them had proved irresistible, and the inhabitants of the earth possessed nothing capable of contending against them. There had been no protection for the great cities, no protection even for the open country. Everything had gone down before the savage onslaught of those merciless invaders from space. Savage ruins covered the sites of many formerly flourishing towns and villages, and the broken walls of great cities stared at the heavens like the exhumed skeletons of Pompeii. The awful agencies had extirpated pastures and meadows and dried up the very springs of fertility in the earth where they had touched it. In some parts of the devastated lands, pestilence broke out. Elsewhere there was famine. Despondency, black as night, brooded over some of the fairest portions of the globe. All not yet destroyed. Yet all had not been destroyed, because all had not been reached by the withering hand of the destroyer. The Martians had not had time to complete their work before they themselves fell a prey to the diseases that carried them off at the very culmination of their triumph. From those lands which had fortunately escaped invasion, relief was sent to the sufferers. The outburst of pity and of charity exceeded anything that the world had known. Differences of race and religion were swallowed up in the universal sympathy which was felt for those who had suffered so terribly from an evil that was as unexpected as it was unimaginable in its enormity. But the worst was not yet. More dreadful than the actual suffering and the scenes of death and devastation which overspread the afflicted lands was the profound mental and moral depression that followed. This was shared even by those who had not seen the Martians and had not witnessed the destructive effects of the frightful engines of war that they had imported for the conquest of the earth. All mankind was sunk deep in this universal despair, and it became tenfold blacker when the astronomers announced from their observatories that strange lights were visible, 
moving and flashing upon the red surface of the planet of war. These mysterious appearances could only be interpreted in the light of past experience to mean that the Martians were preparing for another invasion of the Earth. And who could doubt that with the invincible powers of destruction at their command, they would this time make their work complete and final? A STARTLING ANNOUNCEMENT this startling announcement was the more pitiable in its effects because it served to unnerve and discourage those few of stouter hearts and more hopeful temperaments who had already begun the labor of restoration and reconstruction amid the embers of their desolated homes. In New York, this feeling of hope and confidence, this determination to rise against disaster and to wipe out the evidences of its dreadful presence as quickly as possible had especially manifested itself. Already a company had been formed, and a large amount of capital subscribed for the reconstruction of the destroyed bridges over the East River. Already architects were busily at work planning new twenty-story hotels and apartment houses, new churches, and new cathedrals on a grander scale than before. THE MARTIANS RETURNING Amid this stir of renewed life came the fatal news that Mars was undoubtedly preparing to deal us a death blow. The sudden revulsion of feeling flitted like the shadow of an eclipse over the earth. The scenes that followed were indescribable. Men lost their reason. The faint-hearted ended the suspense with self-destruction. The stout-hearted remained steadfast, but without hope and knowing not what to do. But there was a gleam of hope of which the general public as yet knew nothing. It was due to a few dauntless men of science, conspicuous among whom were Lord Calvin, the great English savant, Herr Röntgen, the discoverer of the famous X-ray, and especially Thomas A. Edison, the American genius of science. These men and a few others had examined with the utmost care the engines of war, the flying machines, the generators of mysterious destructive forces that the Martians had produced, with the object of discovering, if possible, the sources of their power. Suddenly, from Mr. Edison's laboratory at Orange, flashed the startling intelligence that he had not only discovered the manner in which the invaders had been able to produce the mighty energies which they employed with such terrible effect, but that going further he had found a way to overcome them. The glad news was quickly circulated throughout the civilized world. Luckily, the Atlantic cables had not been destroyed by the Martians, so the communication between the eastern and western continents was uninterrupted. It was a proud day for America. Even while the Martians had been upon the earth, carrying everything before them, demonstrating to the confusion of the most optimistic that there was no possibility of standing against them, a feeling, a confidence had manifested itself in France, to a minor extent in England, and particularly in Russia, that the Americans might discover means to meet and master the invaders. Now, it seemed, this hope and expectation were to be realized. Too late, it is true, in a certain sense, but not too late to meet the new invasion which the astronomers had announced was impending. The effect was as wonderful and indescribable as that of the despondency which, but a little while before, had overspread the world. One could almost hear the universal sigh of relief which went up from humanity. To relief succeeded confidence. So quickly does the human spirit recover like an elastic spring when pressure is released. We are ready for them. Let them come, was the almost joyous cry. We shall be ready for them now. The Americans have solved the problem. Edison has placed the means of victory within our power. Looking back upon that time now, I recall with a thrill the pride that stirred me at the thought that, after all, the inhabitants of the earth were a match for those terrible men from Mars, 
despite all the advantage which they had gained from their millions of years of prior civilization and science. As good fortunes, like bad, never come singly, the news of Mr. Edison's discovery was quickly followed by additional glad tidings from that laboratory of marvels in the lap of the Orange Mountains. During their career of conquest, the Martians had astonished the inhabitants of the earth no less with their flying machines, which navigated our atmosphere as easily as they had that of their native planet, than with their more destructive inventions. These flying machines in themselves had given them an enormous advantage in the contest. High above the desolation that they had caused to reign on the surface of the earth, and out of the range of our guns, they had hung safe in the upper air. From the clouds they had dropped death upon the earth. Edison's Flying Machine Now rumor declared that Mr. Edison had invented and perfected a flying machine much more complete and manageable than those of the Martians had been. Wonderful stories quickly found their way into the newspapers concerning what Mr. Edison had already accomplished with the aid of his model electrical balloon. His laboratory was carefully guarded against the invasion of the curious, because he rightly felt that a premature announcement, which should promise more than could be actually fulfilled, would at this critical juncture plunge mankind back again into the gulf of despair, out of which it had just begun to emerge. Nevertheless, inklings of the truth leaked out. The flying machine had been seen by many persons hovering by night high above the orange hills and disappearing in the faint starlight as if it had gone away into the depths of space, out of which it would re-emerge before the morning light had streaked the east and be seen settling down again within the walls that surrounded the laboratory of the great inventor. At length the rumor, gradually deepening into a conviction, spread that Edison himself, accompanied by a few scientific friends, had made an experimental trip to the moon. At a time when the spirit of mankind was less profoundly stirred, such a story would have been received with complete incredulity. But now, rising on the wings of the new hope that was buoying up the earth, this extraordinary rumor became a day star of truth to the nations. A TRIP TO THE MOON And it was true. I had myself been one of the occupants of the car of the flying ship of space on that night when it silently left the earth, and rising out of the great shadow of the globe sped on to the moon. We had landed upon the scarred and desolate face of the earth's satellite, and but that there are greater and more interesting events, the telling of which must not be delayed, I should soon undertake to describe the particulars of this first visit of men to another world. But, as I have already intimated, this was only an experimental trip. By visiting this little nearby island in the ocean of space, Mr. Edison simply wished to demonstrate the practicability of his invention and to convince, first of all, himself and his scientific friends that it was possible for men, mortal men, to quit and to revisit the earth at their will. That aim, this experimental trip, triumphantly attained. It would carry me into technical details that would hardly interest the reader to describe the mechanism of Mr. Edison's flying machine. Let it suffice to say that it depended upon the principle of electrical attraction and repulsion. By means of a most ingenious and complicated construction, he had mastered the problem of how to produce, in a limited space, electricity of any desired potential and of any polarity, and that without danger to the experimenter or to the material experimented upon. It is gravitation, as everybody knows, that makes man a prisoner on the earth. If he could overcome or neutralize gravitation, he could float away a free creature of interstellar space. Mr. Edison, in his invention, had pitted electricity against gravitation. Nature, in fact, had done the same thing long before. Every astronomer knew it, but none had been able to imitate or to reproduce this miracle of nature. 
when a comet approaches the sun the orbit in which it travels indicates that it is moving under the impulse of the sun's gravitation it is in reality falling in a great parabolic or elliptical curve through space but while a comet approaches the sun it begins to display stretching out for millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of miles on the side away from the sun an immense luminous train called its tail this train extends back into that part of space from which the comet is moving thus the sun at one and the same time is drawing the comet toward itself and driving off from the comet in an opposite direction minute particles or atoms which instead of obeying the gravitational force are plainly compelled to disobey it that this energy which the sun exercises against its own gravitation is electrical in its nature hardly anybody will doubt the head of the comet being comparatively heavy and massive falls on toward the sun despite the electrical repulsion but the atoms which form the tail being utmost without weight yield to the electrical rather than to the gravitational influence and so fly away from the sun gravity overcome now what mr edison had done was in effect to create an electrified particle which might be compared to one of the atoms composing the tail of a comet although in reality it was kind of a car of metal weighing some hundreds of pounds and capable of bearing some thousands of pounds with it in its flight by producing with the aid of the electrical generator contained in this car an enormous charge of electricity mr edison was able to counterbalance and a trifle more than counterbalance the attraction of the earth and thus to cause the car to fly off from the earth as an electrified pith ball flies from the prime conductor as we sat in the brilliantly lighted chamber that formed the interior of the car and where stores of compressed air had been provided together with chemical apparatus by means of which fresh supplies of oxygen and nitrogen might be obtained for our consumption during the flight through space mr edison touched a polished button thus causing the generation of the required electrical charge on the exterior of the car and immediately we began to rise the moment and direction of our flight had been so timed and prearranged that the original impulse would carry us straight toward the moon a triumphant test when we fell within the sphere of attraction of that orb it only became necessary to so manipulate the electrical charge upon our car as nearly but not quite to counterbalance the effect of the moon's attraction in order that we might gradually approach it and with an easy motion settle without shock upon its surface we did not remain to examine the wonders of the moon although we could not fail to observe many curious things therein. Having demonstrated the fact that we could not only leave the earth, but could journey through space and safely land upon the surface of another planet, Mr. Edison's immediate purpose was fulfilled, and we hastened back to the earth, employing, in leaving the moon and landing again upon our own planet, the same means of control over the electrical attraction and repulsion between the respective planets and our car which I have already described. Telegraphing the News When actual experiment had thus demonstrated the practicability of the invention, Mr. Edison no longer withheld the news of what he had been doing from the world. The telegraph lines and the ocean cables labored with the messages that, in endless succession and burdened with an infinity of detail, were sent all over the earth. Everywhere the utmost enthusiasm was aroused. Let the Martians come, was the cry. If necessary, we can quit the earth as the Athenians fled from Athens before the advancing host of Xerxes, and like them take refuge upon our ships these new ships of space, with which American inventiveness has furnished us. And then, like a flash, some genius struck out an idea that fired the world. Why should we wait? Why should we run the risk of having our cities destroyed and our lands desolated a second time? 
Let us go to Mars. We have the means. Let us beard the lion in his den. Let us ourselves turn conquerors and take possession of that detestable planet, and if necessary, destroy it in order to relieve the earth of this perpetual threat which now hangs over us like the sword of Damocles. End of chapter 1 Recording by Roger Moline